All right, well, Scripture reading is brief anyway. Just one verse from 1 John 5.13, and let me just mention by way of preface that um, John in this verse is referring back to everything that he has written in this first letter. And he gives to us the reason why he did this. And the reason is that we might know that we have eternal life. In other words, that we might have assurance, assurance that goes beyond uh, just you know, the kind of assurance we, we see given if you have much of a church background, perhaps you've been in other congregations where they might have an altar call and then they'll have everybody pray the sinner's prayer and they'll say, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant that, that you're saved, you're on your way to heaven, you can have assurance and you'll never be lost. Well, that's not actually what the Bible says. The Bible says if you trust in Jesus, yes, you will be saved and you can't be lost, but it doesn't say that by praying that prayer you're saved. So how can you know that you really have come to know Him? Well, that's what this whole letter is about, and we're going to make some references to it in the sermon. But let me read verse 13 of 1 John 5. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. I don't think it could be any clearer than that. Okay, that's the purpose of the letter. By the way, I should mention that, dear brother who's a minister in Christ's church, was doing a memorial service for another dear brother who had passed away. And he used this as his text for the memorial service. And he, he preached from this text, you can know that you have eternal life. Well, how can you know? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's it. That's what John's teaching here. Well, that's not what John is teaching. He is saying you must believe. But how do you know you've truly believed? That's what he's addressing. And that's how we have assurance. Well, again, let, let's combine this with what we've been looking at in the evenings with regard to the Reformation series. Last week, we were looking at how we can have the kind of devotion that we saw in Luther and Calvin and really in all the Reformers. And that is only through the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit. Remember, that's His work of regenerating, of bringing about the new birth. We were reminded that the emphasis today on the Spirit's extraordinary gifts is really misplaced. The author to the Hebrews tells us that these have already served God's purpose, and that purpose was to confirm His gospel. The author writes, or the author to the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4, after it, that is the gospel, was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His will. That's the reason why God gave the charismatic gifts. It was to confirm the message, the message that Jesus brought and that the apostles also preached. God was confirming that message through these gifts. Now, when God's revelation was complete, so were these gifts. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, 10, when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When we have the full revelation of God's will, we no longer need those gifts to give us just pieces of the puzzle because we have the whole thing. But even if God continued to give those extraordinary gifts today, they still could not compare to the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit. Remember what Paul writes in the opening verses of 1 Corinthians 13, that even the greatest of these gifts and even the greatest sacrifices that we could make mean absolutely nothing to God if they're not motivated by the love that the Spirit gives in the new birth. Remember as well that he gave Judas the extraordinary gifts. Judas did miracles. Judas raised the dead. He healed the lepers. But he still perished because he didn't love the Lord. He didn't have the ordinary work of the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit joins himself to our souls, he creates within us a love, which is expressed in the Beatitudes as a hunger that draws us to God's Word, that draws us really to follow righteousness, to love righteousness, wherever we see it, in the Lord, in his people, in his word. Now, again, we reflected last week on the fact that the arguments that Calvin really produced, and we're going to 
hear a little bit about that tonight to prove that the Bible is God's Word, which we saw in R.C. Sproul's series on apologetics, its, its durability, the unity of all that is written in it, the miracles, the prophecy. They might convince us intellectually that the Bible is the Word of God, but we would never have embraced it, trusted in Jesus, surrendered to His will without this love without this ordinary work of the Holy Spirit. So, we saw last week, this is where devotion, the kind of devotion Luther and Calvin had, the kind of devotion, of course, our Lord Jesus had. That's where it begins, with the Spirit's ordinary work of producing this love, and that's why it is so precious. Now, tonight, we're going to be reminded of two more things that the Lord uses to make devotion grow. The two things that Calvin emphasized in his ministry, and that is assurance and worship. Uh, Calvin, again, wants to um, focus his, his hearers, his people, on how we can believe the Bible is God's Word as over against Rome, how we can have the assurance that we really are born again as over against Rome, and how we should worship as over against Rome. Now, this morning, I want us to focus, since we focused on the Word last week, I want us to focus on assurance this week and really to combine these last two elements of, of assurance and worship and how they fit together. So we want to see how assurance is connected to devotion. Assurance feeds it. We want to see how assurance is connected to faith. You know, faith without assurance is, is really not possible. And that's one thing that Calvin wanted to emphasize, that if you have saving faith, you will have some measure of assurance. We want to see how assurance is connected to the evidences of grace. You know, it, it, when we see the Spirit of God working in us, that gives us assurance. And we want to see how it's connected to the means of grace. Okay, and all these things really are connected to one another. We'll, we'll see how that works as we work our way through. So first of all, let's consider the connection between assurance and devotion. Okay. Now, we've already seen the Spirit creates devotion by joining Himself with our souls, by becoming an active principle of love within our hearts. You know, He doesn't just create love and then withdraw. The Spirit of God is that love that is inside of us. He is the one who produces it and who is moving us in a Christward direction. This is His ordinary work, the new birth. This is what gives us spiritual affections. This is what draws our hearts out to the Lord. This is what moves us to surrender to Him, to His Lordship, to His will. Now, in this first point, I want us to see that assurance strengthens that devotion the Spirit of God gives us. Now, what is assurance? Okay, assurance is knowing that the Lord actually does love us. You know, we're, if we're raised in church, and especially in a church that you know, would include children as a part of the congregation. They hear often over and over again, well, the Lord loves you, the Lord loves you. And we just kind of take that for granted. But it's not something that we should necessarily take for granted. It's something that we actually need to know we have the marks of His love upon us, that He really does love us. I mean, we, we come, I think, to a, a point in all of our lives where perhaps we begin to doubt that. Now, it's not just knowing that God loves us as we hear, you know, hear the, about His love for the world in John 3.16, with the kind of love with which He loves the world. And again, the evangelical world thinks that this is referring to the same kind of love with which He loves His children, okay? The kind of love, this kind of love we call a love of benevolence. God does good things for His people. It's the kind of love that moves him to provide for all mankind, even to provide a Savior. Though that's not the kind of love that, that assurance is, is really dealing with. It's, it's really the kind of love with which God loves His Son, that God loves us in that way. We call that a love of complacence, which means that God looks at us and He sees something beautiful in us, and what he sees is his son. That's what's beautiful. And he loves us and accepts us in Christ as something that is actually lovely. 
But you see, the other kind of love is simply God's love sort of moving him to do good things for people that are actually hateful and, and ugly. Okay? That's the kind of love with which God loves the world, but assurance reminds us that he loves us with the kind of love with, that he loves his son. Assurance is also knowing that because he loves us in this way, we are safe within his family, that we belong to him, and that he will never let us go. Now, this knowing that we have this relationship with God, that he loves us, that we're a part of his family, not only strengthens our love for him, our affections for him, you know, moving us to devote ourselves uh, even, you know, more to him, but it removes, I think, all of our concerns, concerns for our well-being. It assures us that because God loves us, he will meet our needs down here. Remember what Jesus said, that if we put his kingdom first, which we will if we love him, that he will give to us everything that we need. You know, don't seek after the things the world seeks after, but seek first the kingdom and everything will be added to you. But it also, of course, takes away our concern for our needs in the world to come. It reminds us that we will inherit eternal life and his kingdom. So assurance, again, strengthens our love for the Lord our devotion to Him. But knowing that all of our needs are going to be met here and in the world to come, it also frees us up to be able to devote ourselves more to Him. I hope you see that, that connection. If we're not so worried about taking care of our needs, you know, working for our daily bread and so forth, because Jesus says we didn't really have to be concerned about that. We still have to work, but we won't have to be concerned. He'll take care of it. If we're not concerned that somehow we're going to end up in hell rather than in heaven so that we're always anxious trying to you know, prove to ourselves that we really know the Lord, it's going to free us up to be able to devote ourselves to serving the Lord. You know, Luther settled that question. Actually, the Lord settled it for him and Calvin. And so they knew they were the Lord's. And that's how they were able to devote themselves so wholeheartedly to his work. Because when you're locked in the anxiety and fear that these things aren't going to be provided, you're just going to be focused on those things. You're not going to be able to be focused on what we should be focused on. So the question, the next question we need to ask is, how can we have assurance? Well, this brings us, secondly, to its connection to faith. Calvin will remind us tonight that assurance is a part of, is of the essence of saving faith. If we have a real genuine faith, um, we already have some measure of assurance. Now, let me just point out that Calvin is not referring to any kind of faith here. He's, he's um, you know, there is a kind of faith, I've already mentioned it, that doesn't assure us because it doesn't save what James refers to as a dead faith, the faith that doesn't produce love, that doesn't produce works, that doesn't produce obedience, the kind of faith the demons have. Basically, they believe the truth and they tremble at it, but they're not saved by it. Now, we call this historic faith or historical faith, a belief in the facts, a belief that the gospel is true. Well, a person can have this kind of faith and not be saved. They can believe the Bible is true intellectually. I think we're going to hear this evening perhaps something that might confuse us on this point, uh, that maybe Calvin thought that these evidences can't convince anyone. I don't think we want to go that far. I think we want to see that these evidences, the Bible's you know, self-attestation, the, you know, all, the, all of its perfections are enough to close the mouths, as R.C. said, of, of even the most obstreperous, the ones that are, that are basically opposed to the gospel, they can be convinced intellectually. People even devote their lives to the study of the Bible, you know, and, and even believe it's true, and yet are unconverted, you know, again, through these evidences that Calvin wrote about. But a person can have this kind of intellectual faith, but still not be saved. And again, Jonathan Edwards would point to the example of the demons. The demons believe, but they're not saved, okay? They're not justified because God hasn't given them saving grace, because God, um, well, they don't love the Lord. 
What Calvin is talking about is saving faith, the kind that the Spirit of God gives to us when he opens our eyes to see God's glory, when he takes away our natural blindness, when he changes our hearts and our hearts are drawn out to God's beauty, when we embrace and apply Christ and all that is in Christ to ourselves, as it were, as he's offered to us in the gospel, because that is what we want. You see, when we experience that, that love for Christ, that desire for Christ, and, and we embrace Him, we trust in Him because we love Him, that gives to us a certain measure of assurance. We know from that experience, you know, the fact that we're trusting Him and we love Him, that we are safe because God has promised to make us safe if we love Him and trust Him. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm going to use these words interchangeably because, um, you know, Edwards talked about how the Spirit of God gives us love. That's what He produces in our hearts. But the fruit of that love is, is faith. The, the kind of faith that saves us is a faith that works by love, right? It's a loving faith. So when we see that loving faith or trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we know the Spirit of God is at work within us. We know that we have some measure of assurance. So saving faith includes some degree of certainty that we actually do belong to the Lord, that we are loved by Him. But that assurance can grow stronger. It can be, you know, it can be weak sometimes. It can be strong sometimes. And it really has to do with how clearly we see this faith working in our lives, this faith that works by love. And so third, let's consider the connection uh, to the evidences of God's grace, the connection of assurance to these evidences. Okay. How can we know that we love and trust the Lord? Well, John tells us that he wrote his first letter really to answer this question. And here's where we get to our text. We read in 1 John 5.13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, so what is it that John tells us that we should be looking for in our lives to know that we love Him? Well, we should be looking for the one thing, I think primarily, that historic faith does not produce in our lives. The thing that James was talking about, faith without works is dead. We should be looking for a faith that produces works, a faith that produces obedience. And if you read 1 John, you're going to see that that is the overwhelming message of the letter. Okay, let me give you an example. John writes in chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Uh, that, that's pretty clear, pretty simple. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And what does that mean? That we, we sort of look at Jesus' gate and we kind of imitate that. No, that's not what he's talking about. But we look at how Jesus lived. And we lived the same way Jesus lived. I mean, how did Jesus live? Well, he obeyed his Father's commandments. And he did that as an example to us, but he also did that that he might gain the Spirit for us and give us the Spirit so that we too could live in exactly the same way. You know, if we treated the issue of assurance and who's a Christian and not a Christian just this simply, I mean, how many people would be excluded? How many people, how many professing Christians allow themselves to sin and say it's okay because God has forgiven me? Shall we sin that grace may abound? You know, Paul says, God forbid. How can we who have been set free from sin still live in it? You see, there's a point behind everything that God is doing, and the point is to make us obedient children. Now, we need to recognize as well, John tells us that we're not going to obey the commandments perfectly, right? John tells us that if we think we have actually arrived at perfection, 
we've only proven that we've never come to know Him. He says in chapter 1, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, why is that? Well, it's because when you are saved and you really love the Lord and you really want to obey Him, it has the effect of sensitizing you to your imperfections, to your sins, so that you become more aware of them. And if you are so oblivious to your sins that you can actually say, I don't sin, well, then you really don't know the Lord. Because if you had the Spirit of God in you, you would know just how great a sinner you really are. So we will obey. Our obedience won't be perfect. But John goes on to say the overall pattern of our lives will be obedience. 1 John 3, verses 6 through 8. No one who abides in Him sins. And we understand by that continual sin practices sin. No one who sins or who practices sin has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. You know, we often read that passage and probably think, yeah, Jesus came into the world to, to you know, deal a death blow to Satan, crush his head on the cross, and certainly he does that. But he also destroys the works of the devil, those works that are in us, the sinful works. He came to free us from our bondage to sin and to give us the freedom to obey him. That's, that's when we see the work of the devil destroyed. So... That's the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. The believer obeys, the unbeliever doesn't obey. And then John goes also on to say this, when we disobey him, we will confess and turn away from that disobedience. Chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, okay? So this will be the pattern of the Christian life. Now, he goes on to say this, if we love God, we're also going to love His people, right? If we love righteousness, we'll love righteousness wherever it's found. We'll we'll love the people of God because we see Christ being formed in them. And we will love them not just in word, but also in deed. John says we will do what we can do to help those who actually are in need. 1 John 3, verses 14 through 20 We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him in whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So John is telling us here that when we see we see ourselves loving the brethren to the point where we will actually be moved to help take care of their needs. That this will help us overcome the condemnation we often feel because of our imperfection and impurity. God is greater than our hearts. He knows all things. This will assure our heart before Him in whatever our heart condemns us. We're talking about assurance. How do you get it? When you see yourself loving God's people. So if if we keep the commandments, if, if, you know, not perfectly, and if we are confessing our sins, if we're loving the brethren, we have come to know him. A couple of other things he mentions are these. If we, if we love the Lord truly, we will not love the world because it's on the other side of the moral spectrum. It's the antithesis of what he commands. Uh, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. 
the world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Do you see kind of an overarching pattern to what John is saying? Sometimes in evangelical churches, sometimes in Reformed churches, we just take the law and we just shove it out of the way, don't we? We think of gospel, gospel, gospel. And we need, do need to realize, as we're going to be reminded again, I think this evening, you know, Luther emphasized the gospel so much, some began to wonder whether he even thought we should be keeping the law. But as Godfrey pointed out, the reason why he did that was because of the environment in which Luther was ministering. It was a legalistic environment. Rome was saying, do this, do this, do this, and if you're good enough, then maybe the Lord will save you. You had to be morally perfect before he would justify you. Well, as over against that kind of environment, you stress the gospel, don't you? Because Luther said, I preach the gospel every day. Justification by grace through faith alone because my people forget it every single week. So I will bring it up every single week. Well, we, we look at that and we, we focus on that and we certainly do want to focus on the gospel. But we don't want to miss the point or the purpose behind it all which is to transform us into the image of Jesus who lived perfectly according to the commandments of God. So John is stressing that. Jesus stressed that as well in his ministry. And one last thing that John tells us we'll have, we will also have the ministry of the Holy Spirit who will not only convince us that, that what we've just read is true, okay, that, that that is how we tell the difference. This is the reason why Jesus came into the world but also that Jesus is the Christ who came in our nature in order to take away our failures and to give us the power to obey Him. Again, the blessing of the new covenant is having the law written upon our hearts. And understanding that we can deceive ourselves into thinking that these things are all true of us when they are really not true, the Spirit has also been given to us to show us that what we believe and what we do really is motivated by a true love for God. That's what's meant, I believe, by the Spirit, the Spirit's internal witness, the down payment, as it were, this, you know, the down payment of the inheritance is this joy in the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit illumines the things going on in our lives that prove that we really do belong to Him. We really do love Him. And that's what gives us the confidence to be able to call God our Father. I'm not sure that it's simply the confidence to say, God, you are my Father, and, and to believe that that's true, because a lot of people do that and they're not saved. But to be able to say it and know it's true, because we have this evidence in our lives that we really are loving and trusting Him. We're, we're submitting to Him, we're obeying Him because we want to do that. We're doing it out of love. So when we see ourselves obeying God's commandments and know that we're doing this from the heart because we want to, because we love them, that strengthens our assurance. And by the way, that also strengthens our devotion to the Lord because it assures us that God loves us, He'll never let go of us, and for the reasons we saw before, it will strengthen our devotion. Now, this means, last point, that if we are to have a stronger assurance, we need to have a stronger love. You know, love is what's going to produce these kinds of fruits. And when we see more of these kinds of things, because we really want to do these kinds of things, it will strengthen our assurance. So finally, I want us to see the connection of assurance to the means of grace. Now, how do we strengthen our love for the Lord? Well, the only way we can are in the ways that God has given us to do this, right? We call them the means of grace. These are the ways by which we draw near to the Lord, have communion with Him. Yeah? Uh, if we want a stronger love, we need to spend more time with Him. First of all, we need to spend more time in His Word. We need to hear the voice of God. This is how He speaks to us. This is how He reveals His love to us. This is how He tells us how we are to love Him. It, it, it's all in the Word of God. We need to spend time in the Word. By the way, not just once a week when you hear some of it read from the pulpit, but every single day reading. Don't wait till the end of the day. You know, Read it early in the day. 
Let it direct your life. Let God speak to you. Let Him begin in the morning and speak to you throughout the entire day and at night as well. We need to spend time with Him in prayer. This is how we speak to the Lord. This is how we get His help to be able to do what He calls us to do. Now think about this. If you wait till the end of the day to pray, your, your whole day has gone already. You, you need His help in the, you know, all through the day. So you need to ask in the morning that the Lord will give you the grace to help you walk with Him and love Him in the things you do. We need to spend time praising the Lord. That's, that's one of the reasons why I like the guitar is because you can take it anywhere and you can use it and you can worship, but you don't need a musical instrument. You know, you can sing without instruments. As a matter of fact, we're going to hear this evening that Calvin thought that's exactly what we should do. Don't sing with instruments. Sing just using your voices. Use human instrumentation. And um, Godfrey doesn't have time to get into it. He'll ex he doesn't explain why Calvin believed that, but uh, we'll, just, we'll just go with that for now. But we need, we need to sing, okay? Because singing with psalms, and he was almost exclusive psalmody, but we sing with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, and we don't see those as just titles of the different psalms in the, in the book of Psalms or the Psalter. But we believe that these are differing types of songs that we are to offer to the Lord. But this is how we express our love, our adoration to Him. And again, as I mentioned, we need to do this each day and at the start of the day. It doesn't have to be lengthy, but spend some time with Him. If, if I mention this, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not trying to step on any toes here, but um, I think we especially need, as we think about obedience... We especially need to honor the Sabbath, okay? The Sabbath commandment is a part of the Ten Commandments. It's a part of what Jesus did. It's one of those laws that God writes on our hearts, gives us the desire to do. It's something that He said would continue even after His ministry was over, okay? It's still there because we still need a day of rest. We still need a day that's in common for all of us to get together and worship the Lord, okay? He still wants that day. So we need to stop using the Sabbath the way we want to use it, and we need to begin to give Him all of it because that's really what He calls us to do. You know, six days I've given you to labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. And the reason why He says that is so we can all get together and worship him. Okay, that's one of the reasons, by the way, we, we do two services on a Lord's Day. It, it's to help us spend that time with the Lord. If you have two services, you'll find it pretty much occupies a lot of the day, doesn't it? But it helps us, again, to focus on Him, which is what we need to do. So finally, let's just remember this, that love can, again, it can be strengthened in these ways, also through serving Him, also through sacrificing for Him, also through fellowshipping with one another, also through participating in His Supper. These are the ways we draw near to the Lord. But it can also be weakened, and we have to be careful. When we fail to do what the Lord calls us to do when we, when we sin, it weakens us. It weakens us in every area. That's why we need to Again, we need to turn from all of our sins and we need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and we need to pursue these things so that we'll be strong. So to sum up, devotion is strengthened by assurance. Assurance is strengthened by seeing God's love active within our hearts and in our lives. And love is strengthened by drawing near to God through the means of grace, fellowship and service, and by turning from every sin, okay? Not only what God tells us not to do, those seem to be the ones we focus on most of all. You know, don't do this, don't do that. Yeah, those are the ones we focus on, but he also says do this and do that, right? And when we don't do this and do that, we are sinning just as much as when we do what he tells us not to do. We need to turn from all of our sins, and that will strengthen our love and our assurance and our devotion. So if we want to see within ourselves the kind of devotion that we saw in the Lord Jesus Christ, the same kind that we saw in Luther and Calvin, 
this is the only way that we're going to find it. There's no magic formula outside of this. This is the way. So may the Lord help us to take this path. May He help us to, to do these things and to pursue this kind of sanctification and, and love that we might have that devotion. It's, it's a virtuous circle. The more we do it, the more we go that way, the stronger we'll be. Just like the vicious circle is, the more we get away from these things, the more we're going to spiral down into a pit. And we know that even true believers can go pretty deep. Just think about David and what he fell into because he wasn't drawing near to God. So let's be encouraged to pursue him. Let, let's uh, spend a few moments in silent prayer. I'll close with prayer and then we'll celebrate the table.